book sapiens a brief history of human kind by yuval noah harari part number 1 the cognitive revolution chapter number 2 the tree of knowledge in the previous chapter we saw that although sapiens had already populated east african 150000 years ago they began to overrun the rest of planet earth and drive the other human sapiens to extinction only about 70000 years ago in the intervening millennia even though these archaic sapiens looked just like us and their brains were as big as ours they did not enjoy any marked advantage over other humans species did not produce particularly sophisticated tools and did not accomplish any other special feats in fact in the first recorded encounter between sapiens and the neanderthals the neanderthals one about 100000 years ago some sapiens groups migrated north to the levant which was neanderthals t- territory but failed to secure a firm footing it might have been due to nasty natives and inclement climate or unfamiliar local parasites whatever the reason the sapiens eventually retreated leaving the neanderthals as masters of the middle east this poor record of achievement has led scholars to speculate that the internal structure of the brain of these sapiens was probably different from ours they looked like us but their cognitive cognitive abilities learning re- remembering communicating were far more limited teaching such as an ancient sapiens english persuading him of the truth of christian dogma or getting him to understand the theory of evolution would probably have been hopeless undertakings conversely we would have had a very hard time learning his language and understanding his way of thinking but then beginning about 70000 years ago homo sapiens started doing very special things around that date sapiens band left a free second time this time they drove the neanderthals and all other homo- human sapiens not only from the middle east but from the face of the earth within a remarkably short period sapiens reached europe and east asia about 45000 years ago they somehow crossed the open sea and landed in australia a continent hitherto untouched by humans the period from about 70000 years ago to about 30000 years ago witnessed the invention of boats oil lamps bows and arrows and needles the first objects that can reliably be called are dated from this era as does the first clear evidence of religion commerce and social stratification most researchers believe that these unprecedented accomplishments were the product of revolution in sapiens cognitive abilities they maintain that the people who drove the neanderthals to extinction settled Australia and carved the straddle line man were as intelligent creative and sensitive as we are if we were to come across the artist of the straddle cave which could learn their language and they ours we would be able to explain to them everything we know from the adventures of Alice in Wonderland to the paradoxes of quantum physics and they could teach us how their people view the world the appearance of new ways of thinking and communicating between 70000 and 30000 years ago constitutes the cognitive revolution what caused it we are not sure the most commonly believed theory argues that accidental genetic mutations changed the inner wiring of the brains of sapiens enabling them to think in unprecedented ways and to communicate using an all together new type of language who we might call it the tree of knowledge mutation why did it occur in sapiens dna rather than in that of neanderthals it was a matter of pure chance as far as we can tell but it's more important to understand the consequences of the tree of knowledge mutation than its causes what was so special about the new sapiens language that it enabled us to conquer the world 
इट वॉज नॉट द फर्स्ट लैंग्वेज एवरी एनिमल हैज सम काइंड ऑफ लैंग्वेज इवन इंसेक्ट्स सच एज बीज एंड एड्स नो हाउ टू कम्युनिकेट इन सोफिस्टिकेटेड वेज इनफॉर्मिंग वन एंड अनदर ऑफ द वेयर अबाउट्स ऑफ फूड नीदर वॉज इट इट द फर्स्ट वोकल लैंग्वेज मैनी एनिमल्स इंक्लूडिंग आल एप्स एंड मोंकीज स्पीशीज हैव वोकल लैंग्वेजेज फॉर एग्जाम्पल ग्रीन मोंकीज यूज कॉल्स ऑफ वेरियस काइंड टू कम्युनिकेट Zoologists have identified one call that means careful and eagle a slightly different call warns careful a lion when researchers played a recording of a first call to a group of monkeys the monkeys saw what they were doing and looked upward in fear when the same group heard a recording of the second call the lion warning they quickly scrambled up a tree sapiens can produce many more distinct sounds than green monkeys but whales and elephants have equally impressive abilities a parrot can say anything albert einstein could say as well as mimicking the sounds of phone ringing door slamming and siren wailing whatever advantage einstein had over a parrot it was not vocal what then is so special about our language The most common answer is that our language is amazingly supple. We can connect a limited number of sounds and signs to produce an infinite number of sentences, each with a distinct meanings. We can thereby in in just store and communicate a prodigious amount of prodigious amount of information about surrounding world. A green monkey can yell to its Comrades careful a lion but a modern human can tell her friends that this morning near the bend in the river she saw a lion tracking a herd of bison she can then describe the exact location include including the different paths leading to the area with this information the member of her band can put their heads together and discuss whatever they ought to approach the river in order to chase away the lion and hunt the bison a second theory agrees the that our unique language evolved as a meaning of sharing information about the world but the most important important information that needed to be conveyed was about human not about lions and bison our language evolved as a way of gossiping according to this theory homo sapiens is primarily a social animal social cooperation is our key for survival and reproduction it is not enough for individual men and women to know the whereabouts of lion and bison it's much more important for them to know who who in their band hates worm and who is sleeping with worm who is honest and who is a cheat out of information that one must obtain and store in order to track the ever changing relationships of a few dozen individuals is staggering and countless more complex social combination all apes show a keen interest in such social information but they have trouble gossiping effectively neanderthals and our archaic uh, archaic homo sapiens probably also had a hard time talking behind each other's back a much maligned city which is in fact essential for cooperation in large numbers the new linguistic skills that modern sapiens acquired about 70 millennia ago enabled them to gossip for hours on end reliable information about who could be trusted mean that small bands could expand into a larger bands and sapiens could develop tighter and more sophisticated types of cooperation the gossip theory might sound like a joke but numerous studies support it Even today the vast majority of humans communication whether in the form of emails phone calls or newspaper columns is gossip it comes so naturally to us that it seems as if our language evolved for this very purpose do you think that history professors chat about the reasons for world war 1 when they meet for the lunch or that nuclear physicists spend their coffee breaks at scientific conf- conferences talking about quarks sometimes but more often they gossip about the professor who who caught her husband cheating or the quarrels between the head of the department and the dean or the rumors that colleagues used his research fund to buy a lexis 
Gossip usually focuses on the wrongdoings. Rumor Rumors are the original fourth estate journalist who inform society about and thus protect it from cheats and freeloaders. Most likely, both the gossip theory and there is a line near the river theory are valid. Yet the truly unique feature of our language is not its ability to transmit information about men and lines. Rather, it's the ability to transmit information about things that do not exist at all. As far as we know, only sapiens can talk about entire kinds of entities that they never seen, touched or smelled. Legends, myths, gods and religions appeared for the first time with the cognitive revolution. Many animals and human species could previously say careful. A line thanks to the cognitive revolution, Homo sapiens acquired the ability to say the line is the guardian spirit of our tribe. The ability to speak about fictions is the most unique feature of sapiens language. It's relatively easy to agree that only Homo sapiens can speak about Things that don't really exist and believe six impossible things before breakfast. You could never convince a monkey to give you a banana by promising him limitless bananas after death in monkey's heaven. But why is it important? After all, fiction can be dangerously misleading or distracting. People who go to forest looking for fairies and unicorns would seem to have less chance of survival than people who go looking for mushrooms and deer. And if you spend hours praying to non-existing guardian spirits, are not you wasting precious time? Time better spent for aging, fighting and fornicating. But fiction has enabled us not merely to imagine things but to do so collectively. We can weave common myths such as the biblical creation story, the dream time myths of Aboriginal Australians and the nationalist myth of modern states. Such myths give sapiens the unprecedented ability to cooperate flexibly in large numbers. Ants and bees can also work together in huge numbers, but they do so in a very rigid manner and only with close relatives. Wolves and chimpanzees cooperate for many flexible than far flexible than ants, but they can do so only with small number of other individuals that they know intimately. Sapiens can cooperate in extremely flexible ways with countless numbers of strangers. That's why sapiens rule the world. Whereas our ants eat our leftovers and chimps are locked up in zoos and research laboratories. The Legend of Fusos so, Our chimpanzees' cousins usually live in small groups of several dozen individuals. They form close friendship, hunt together and fight shoulder to shoulder against baboons, cheetahs, and enemy chimpanzees. Their social structure tend to hierarchical. The dominant member who is almost always a male is termed the alpha male. Other males and females exhibit their submission to the alpha male by bowing there for him while making grunting sounds not unlike, unlike human subjects kowtowing before a king. The alpha male strives to maintain social harmony within his troop. When two individuals fight, he will intervene and stop the violence. Less benevolently, he might monopolize particularly coveted foods and prevent lower ranking males from mating with the females. When two males are contesting the alpha position, they usually do so, forming extensive coalitions of supporters. Both male and female from within the group ties between coalition. Members are based on intimate daily contact, hugging, touching, kissing, grooming, and mutual favors just as human politicians on election campaigns go around shaking hands and kissing babies so aspirants to the top position. In a chimpanzee's group spend much time hugging, back slapping, and kissing baby chimpanzees. The alpha male usually wins his position not because he is physically stronger but because he leads a large and stable coalition. These coalitions play a central part not only during over the struggles for the alpha position but in almost all day-to-day -day activities, members of the coalition spend more time together, share food and help one another in time of travel. There are 
clear limits to the size of groups that can be formed and maintained in such a way in order to function all member of a group must know each other intimately to two chimpanzees who have never met never fought and never engaged in mutual grooming will not know whether they can trust one another whether it would be worthwhile to help one another and which of them ranks higher under natural conditions a typical chimpanzee troop consists of about 20 to 50 conditions a typical chimpanzee troop consists of about 20 to 50 individuals as the number of chimpanzees in a troop increases the social order destabilizes eventually leading to a rupture and the formation of a new troop by some of the animals only in the handful of cases have zoologists observed groups larger than a hundred separate groups seldom cooperate and tend to complete for territory and food researcher have documented prolonged warfare between groups and even one case of genocidal activity in which one troop systematically slaughtered most member of neighboring band similar pattern probably dominated the social lives of early humans including archaic humans homo sapiens humans like chimps have a social instinct that enabled our ancestor to form friendship and hierarchies and to hunt or fight together however like the social instincts of chimps those of humans were adopted only for small intimate groups when the group grew too large its social order destabilized stabilized and the band split even if a particularly fertile valley could feed 500 archaic sapiens there was no way that so many strangers could live together how could they agree who should be leader who should hunt where or who should mate with whom in the wake of the cognitive revolution gossip helped homo sapiens to form form larger and more stable bands but even gossip has its limits psychological research has shown that the maximum natural size of a group bonded by the gossip gossip is about 150 individuals most people can neither intimately know or know gossip effectively about more than 150 human beings even today a critical hold in human organizations falls somewhere around this magic number below this threshold communities business social networks and military units can maintain themselves based mainly on intimate acquaintance and rumor mongering there is no need for formal ranks titles and law bro- books to keep order the plateau a plateau of thirsty soldier or even a company of 100 soldiers can function well on the basis of intimate relations with a minimum formal discipline a well respected sergeant can become king of the company and exercise authority even over commissioned officers a small family business can survive and flourish without a board of directors a ceo or or an accounting department but once the threshold of 150 individual is crossed things can no longer work that way you cannot run a division with thousand of soldiers the same way you run a platoon Successful family businesses usually face a crisis when they grow larger and hire more persons. If they cannot reinvent themselves, they go bust. How did Homo sapiens manage to cross this critical threshold? Eventually founding cities, compromising tens of thousands of inhabitants and empires ruling hundreds of millions. The secret was probably the appearance appearance of fictions large number of strangers can cooperate successfully by believing in common myths any large scale human cooperation whether a modern state a, a medieval church an ancient city or an ar- archaic tribe is rooted in common myth that exist only in people's collective imaginations churches are rooted in common religious myth catholics who have never met can never the less go together on crusade or pool funds to build a hospital because they both believe that god was incarnated in human flesh and allowed himself to be crucified to redeem our sins states are rooted in common national myth two serbs who have never met might risk their lives to save one another because both believe in the existence of the serbian nation the serbian homeland and the serbian flag 
judicial systems are rooted in common legal myths. Two lawyers who have never met can nevertheless combine efforts to defend a complete stranger because stranger because they both believe in the existence of laws, justice, human rights and the money paid out in fees. Yet none of these things exist outside the stories that people invent and tell one another. There are no gods in the universe, no nations, no money, no human rights, no laws and no justice outside the common imagination of human beings. People easily understand that primitives cement their social order by believing in ghosts and spirits and gathering each full moon to dance together around the campfire. What we fail to appreciate is that our modern institutions function on exactly the same basis. Take for example the world of business corporation, modern business people and lawyers are in fact powerful sorcerers. The principal difference between them and tribal shamans is that modern lawyers tell far stranger tales. Legend of Puzo affords us a good example, an icon that somewhat resembles the steadily Lineman appears today on cars, trucks, and motorcycles from Paris to Sydney. It's the hood ornament that adorns vehicles made by Fujo, one of the oldest and largest of Europe's car makers. Fujo began, began as a small family business in the village of Valentini, just 300 km from the Stadel Cape. Today, the company employs about 200,000 people worldwide, most of whom are completely strangers to each other. These strangers cooperate so effectively that in 2008, Peugeot produced more than 1.5 million automobiles earning revenues of about 55 billion euros. In what sense can we say that Peugeot as a com the company's official name exists? There are many Pujo vehicles, but there are obviously not the company. Even if every Pujo in the world were simultaneously junked and sold for scrap metal, Pujo's SA would not disappear. It would continue to manufacture new cars and issue its annual report. The company owns factories, machinery and showrooms and employs mechanics, accountants and secretaries but all these together do not compromise Peugeot. A disaster might kill every single one of Peugeot's employees and go on to destroy all of its assembly lines and executive offices. Even then, the company could borrow money, hire new employees, build new factories and buy new machinery. Peugeot has managers and shareholders, but neither do they constitute the company. All the managers could be dismissed and all its shares sold, but the company itself would remain intact. It doesn't mean that Peugeot is unvulnerable or immortal. If a judge were to mandate the dissolution of the company, its factories would remain standing and its workers, accountants, managers and shareholders would continue to live. But Peugeot would immediately vanish. In short, Peugeot seems to have no essential connection to the physical world. Does it really exist? Peugeot is a figment of our collective imagination. Lawyers call this a legal fiction. It can't be pointed at. It is not a physical object, but it exists as a legal entity. Just like you or me, it is bound by the laws of countries in which it operates. It can open a bank account and own property. It pays taxes. It pay taxes, taxes, and it can be sued and even prosecuted separately from any of the people who own or work for it. Fujio belongs to a particular legal fiction called limited liability companies. The idea behind such companies is among humanity most ingenious inventions. Homo sapiens lived for untold millennia without them. During most of recorded history, property could be owned only by flesh and blood humans, the kind that stood on two legs and had big brains. If in 13th century, Franz Jean set up a wagon manufacturing workshop, he himself was, was, was a business. If a wagon he would made broke down a week after purchase, the dad disgruntled buyer would have sued Jean 
personally if jean had borrowed 1000 gold coin to set up his workshop and the business failed he would have had to repay the loan by selling his private property his own house his cow his land he might even have had to sell his children into servitude if he could not cover the debt he could be thrown in prison by the state of unserved and slaved by his creditors he was fully liable without limit for all obligations incurred by his workshop if you had lived back then you would probably have thought twice before you opened an enterprise of your own and indeed this legal situation discouraged entrepreneurship people were afraid to start new businesses and take economic risks it hardly seemed worth taking the chance that their families could end up utterly destitute This is why people began collectively to imagine the existence of limited liability companies. Such companies were legally independent of the people who set them up or invested money in them or managed them. Over the last few centuries such companies have become the main players in the economic arena. And we have grown so used to them that we forget they exist only in our imagination. In the US the technical terms for a limited liability company is a corporations which is ironic because the term derives from corpus the one thing these corporations lack despite their having no real bodies the american legal system treats corporations as legal persons as if they were flesh and blood human beings and so did the french legal system back in 1896 when armand jo who had inherited from his parents a metal working shop that produced string saws and bicycles decided to go into a automobile business to that and he set up a limited liability company He named the company after himself but it was independent of him if one of the cars broke down the buyer could sue the Peugeot but not Armand Peugeot if the company borrowed millions of francs and then went bust Armand Peugeot did not owe its creditors a single franc the loan after all had been given to Peugeot the company not Armand Peugeot the homo sapiens Armand Peugeot Pujo died in 1915 Pujo the company is still alive and well he exactly did armand pujo the man created pujo the company in much the same way that and sorcerers have created gods and demons throughout the history and in which thousands of french cures were still creating christ christ's body every sunday in the parish churches It all revolved around telling stories and convincing people to believe them. In the case of French cures, the crucial story was that of Christ's life and death as told by the Catholic Church. According to this story, if a Catholic priest dressed in his sacred garments solemnly said the right words at the right moment, mundane bread and wine turned into a goat's flesh and blood. The priest exclaimed, "Hocus corpus meum." Latin for this is my body and hocus pocus the bread turned into a christ flesh seeing that the priest had properly assiduously observed all procedures million of devout french catholic behaved as if god really existed in the consecrated bread and wine in the case of pujos The crucial story was the French legal code as written by the French parliament according to the French legislator if a certified liar followed all the proper liturgy and ritual rituals wrote all the required spells and oath on a wonderfully decorated piece of paper and affixed his ornate signature to a bottom of the document then hocus pocus a new company was incorporated when in 1896 armand Pujo wanted to create his company. He paid a lawyer to go through all the sacred procedures. Once the lawyer had performed all the right rituals and pronounced all the necessary spells and oaths, millions of upright French citizens behaved as if the Pujo company really existed. Telling effective stories is not easy. The difficulty lies not in telling the story but in convincing everyone else to believe it. Much of history revolves around his 
these questions how does one convince million of people to believe particular stories about gods or nations or limited liability companies yet when it succeeds it gives sapiens immense power because it enables million of strangers to cooperate and work towards common goals just try to imagine how difficult it would have been to create states or churches or legal system if we could speak only about things that really exist such as rivers trees and lines over the years people have woven an incredibly complex network of stories with this network fictions such as pujo not only exist exist but also accumulate immense power the kinds of things that people create through this network of stories are known in academic circles as fiction social const- construct constructs or imagined re- realities an imagined reality is not a lie i lie when i say that there is a line near the river when i know perfectly well that there is no line there there is nothing special about lies green monkeys and chimpanzees can lie a green monkey for example has been observed calling careful a line when there was a no line around this alarm conveniently frightened away a fellow monkey who had just found a banana leaving the lawyer all alone to steal the prize for itself and like lying on an imagined reality is something that everyone believes in and as long as this communal belief persists the imagined reality exerts force in the world the sculptor from the saddle cave may sincerely have believed in the existence of the lion man guardian spirit Some sources are charlatans but most sincerely believe in existence of gods and demons most millionaires sincerely believe in the existence of money and limited liability companies most human right activists sincerely believe in the existence of human right no one was lying when in 2 2011 the un demanded that the libyan government respect the human right of its citizens even though the un libya and the human rights are all figments of our fertile imaginations ever since the cognitive revolution sapiens has thus been living in dual reality on the one hand the objective reality of river trees and lines and on the other hand the imagined imagined reality of gods nations and corporations as time went by the imagined reality became it were ever more powerful so that today the very survival of river trees and lines depends on the grace of imagined in entities such as gods nation and corporations by passing the genome the ability to create an imagined reality out of words enabled large numbers of strangers to cooperate effectively but it also did something more since large scale human cooperation is based on myths the way people cooperate can be altered by changing the myths by telling different stories under the right circumstances myth can change rapidly in 9 in 1789 the french population switched almost overnight from believing in the myth of divine right of king to believing in the myth of the sovereignty of the people consequently ever since the cognitive revolution homo sapiens has been able to revise its behavior repeatedly in accordance with changing needs this opened a fast lane of cultural evolution by passing the traffic jams of genetic evolution speeding down this fast lane homo sapiens soon far out, outstripped all other human and animals species in its ability to cooperate the behavior of other social animal is determined to a large extent by their genes dna is not a autocrat animal behavior is also influenced by in, environmental factors and in, individual quirks nevertheless is a given environment animal of the same species will tend to behave in a similar way significant changes changes in social behavior cannot occur in general without genetic mutations for example common chimpanzees have a genetic tendency to live in hierarchical groups headed by an alpha male member of closely related, related chimpanzee species bonobos usually live in more egalitarian groups dominated by female alliances female common chimpanzees cannot take lesson from their bonobo relatives and stage of 
feminist revolution male chimps cannot gather in a constitutional assembly to abolish the office of a alpha male and declare that from here on out all chimps are to be treated as equals such dramatic changes in behavior would occur only if something changed in chimpanzee's dna for similar reason archaic human did not initiate any revolutions as far as we can tell changes in social patterns the invention of new technologies and the settlement of alien habitats resulted from genetic mutation and environmental pressures more than from cultural initiatives this is why it took humans hundreds of thousands of years to make these step 2 million years ago genetic mutations results in the appearance of new human species called homo erectus its emergence was accompanied by the development of a new stone tool technology now recognized as a defining feature of this species as long as homo erectus did not undergo further genetic alter- alterations its stone tools remained roughly the same for close 2 million years in contrast ever since the cognitive revolutions sapien have been able to change their behavior quickly transmitting new behaviors to future generation without any need of genetic or environmental change as prime example consider the repeated appearance of childless elites such as the catholic priesthood buddhist monastic orders and chinese eunuch bureaucracies the existence of such elites goes against the most fundamental principles of natural selection since these dominant members of society willingly give up procreation whereas chimpanzee alpha males use their power to have sex with as many females as possible and consequently sire a large proportion of their troops young the catholic alpha male abstained completely from sexual intercourse and child care abstinence does not result from unique environmental conditions such as a severe lack of food or want of our potential mates nor is it the result of some quirky gen- genetic mutation the catholic the catholic church has survived for centuries not by passing on a celibacy gene from one pope to the next but by passing on the stories of the new testament and and of catholic canon law in other words while the be- behavior pattern of archaic humans remained fixed for 10 of thousands of years sapiens could transform their social structures the nature of their interpersonal relations their econ- economic activities and a host of other behaviors within a decade or two consider a resident of berlin born in 1900 and living to the ripe age of 100 she spent her childhood in the hohenzollern empire of wilhelm her adult years in the weimar republic the nazi third reich and communist east germany and she died a citizen of a democratic and reunified germany she had managed to be part of five very different socio political system though her dna remained exactly the same this was the key to sapiens success in one on one brawl a neanderthal would probably have beaten a sapiens but in a conf- conflict of a hundreds neanderthals would not stand a chance neanderthals could share information about the where about of lions but they probably could not tell and revise stories about tribal spirits without an an, abil- an ability to compose fiction neander neanderthals were unable to cooperate effectively in large numbers nor could they adapt their social behavior to rapidly changing challenges while we can't get inside a neanderthal mind to understand how they thought we have indirect evidence of the limit to their cognition compared with their sapiens rivals archaeologists ex- excavating 30000 years old sapiens sites in the european heartland occasionally find their seashells from the Mediterranean and Atlant- Atlantic coast in all likelihood these shells go to continental interior through long distance trade between different sapiens bands Neanderthal sites lack any evidence of such trade each group manufacture its own tools from local mar- materials and 
Another example comes from the South Pacific sapiens bands that lived on the island of New Ireland north of New Jenny used a volcanic glass called obsidian to manufacture particularly strong and sharp tools. New Ireland however, however has no natural deposit of obsidian. Laboratory tests revealed that the obsidian they used was brought from deposits on New Britain and New Britain an island 400 km away. Some of the inhabitants of these islands must have been skilled navigators who traded from island to island over long distances. Trade may seem a very pragmatic activity, one that needs to fictive basis. Yet the fact is that no animal other than sapiens engages the trade, and all the sapiens trade network about which we have detailed evidence were based on fictions. fictions. Trade cannot exist without trust and it is very difficult to trust strangers. The global trade network of today is based on our trust in such fictional entities as the dollar, the Federal Reserve Bank and the totemic trademark of corporations. When two strangers in a tribal society want to trade, they will often establish trust by appealing to a common god, mythical ancestor or totem animal. If Archic Sapiens believing in such fiction traded shells and obsidian it stand to reason that they could also have traded information thus creating a much denser and wider knowledge network than the one that served Neanderthals and other archaic humans. Hunting techniques provide an other illustration of these differences. Neanderthalers usually hunted alone or in small groups. Sapiens, on the other hand, developed techniques that relied on cooperation between many dozen of individuals and perhaps even between different bands. One particularly effective method was to surround an entire herd of animals such as wild horses, then chase them into a narrow gorge where it was easy to slaughter them mass if all went and mass and mass if all went according to plan the bands could harvest tons of meat fat and animal skin in a single afternoon of collective effort and either consume these riches in a giant potlash or dry smoke or freeze them for later usage archaeologist have discovered sites where entire herds were butchered annually in such ways. There are even sites where fences and obstacles were erected in order to create artificial traps and slaughtering grounds. We may presume that Neanderthalers were not pleased to see the, their traditional hunting grounds turned into a sapiens-controlled slaughtered houses. However, if violence broke out between the two species, Neanderthalers were not much better off than wild horses. Fifty Neanderthalers cooperating in traditional and static patterns were no match for 500 versatile and innovative sapiens. And even if the sapiens lost the first round, they could quickly invent new stratagem that would enable them to win the next time. What happened? In the cognitive revolution, new ability, the ability to transmit larger quantities of information about the world surrounding Homo sapiens, wider consequences, planning and carrying out complex actions such as avoiding lions and hunting bison. New ability, the ability to transmit larger quantities of information about sapiens social relationship, wider consequences, large, larger and more comprehensive group numbering up to 150 individuals. New ability, the ability tra to transmit information about things that do not really exist such as tribal spirits, nations, limited liability companies and human rights. Wider consequences are cooperation between very large number of strangers. Another wider consequence is rapid innovation of social behavior. History and Biology The immense diversity of imagined realities that sapiens invented and resulting diversity of behavior patterns are the main components of what we call cultures. Once cultures appeared, they never ceased to change and develop and these unstoppable alterations are what we call history. 
द कोगनेटिव रेवोल्यूशन इज अकॉर्डिंगली द पॉइंट वेन हिस्ट्री डिक्लेयर्ड इट्स इंडिपेंडेंस फ्रॉम बायोलॉजी अंटिल द कोगनेटिव रेवोल्यूशन द डूइंग ऑफ ऑल ह्यूमन स्पीशीज बिलोंग टू अ रिलैम ऑफ बायोलॉजी और इफ यू प्रीफर प्री हिस्ट्री फ्रॉम द कोगनेट रेवोल्यूशन ऑनवर्ड्स हिस्टोरिकल नेरेटिव रिप्लेस बायोलॉजिकल थ्यूरीज एज अवर प्राइमरी मीन्स ऑफ एक्सप्लेनिंग द डिवेलपमेंट ऑफ होमोसेपियंस टू अंडरस्टैंड द राइज ऑफ क्रिस्चैनिटी और द फ्रेंच रेवोल्यूशन इट इज़ नॉट इनफ टू कंप्रीहेंड द इंटरेक्शन ऑफ जीन्स होमोज एंड ऑर्गेनिजम इट इज़ नेसेसरी टू टेक इन टू अकाउंट द इंटरेक्शन ऑफ आइडियाज इमेज एंड फैंटिसीज एज वेल दिस डज नॉट मीन दैट होमोसेपियंस एंड ह्यूमन कल्चर बिकेम exempt from biological laws we are still animals and our physical emotional and cognitive abilities are still shaped by our dna our societies are built from the same building blocks as neanderthal or chimpanzee societies and the more we examine 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 these building blocks sensations emotions family ties the less differences we find between us and other apes it is however a mistake to look for the differences at the level of the individual or the family one or one even 10 or 10 we are embarrassingly similar to chimpanzee significant significant differences begin to appear only when we cross the threshold of 150 in individuals and when we reach 1000 to 2000 in individ- individuals the differences are astounding if you try to bunch together thousands of chimpanzees into a thin human square wall street the vectian or the headquarters of the united nations the result would be pandemonium by contrast sapiens regularly gather by thousand in such places together they create orderly patterns such as trade network mass celebrations and political institutions that they could never have created in isolation the real difference between us and chimpanzees is that mythical glue that binds together large number of individual families and groups this glue has made us the master of creation of course we also need other skills such as the ability to make and use tools yet tool making is a little of consequence unless it is coupled with the ability to cooperate with many others how is it, how is it that we now have in, inter, intercontinental missiles with nuclear warheads whereas 30000 years ago we had only sticks with flint super spearhead psychologically there has been no significant improvement in our tool making capacity over the last 30000 years albert einstein einstein was far less dexterous with his hands than was an ancient hunter gatherer however our capacity to cooperate with large number of strangers has improved dramatically the ancient flint spear head was manufactured in minutes 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 by a single person who relied on the advice and help of few intimate friends the production of a modern nuclear warhead required the cooperation of millions of strangers all over the world from the worker who mined the uranium or in the depth of the earth to theoretical physicists who write long mathematical formulas to describe the interactions of the subatom- uh, subatomic particles summarize the relationship between biology and history after the cognitive revolution biology set the basic parameter for the behavior and capacities of homo sapiens the whole of history take place within the bounds of this biological arena, arena however this arena is extraordinarily large allowing sapiens to play an astounding variety of games thanks to their ability to intend, invent fiction sapiens create more and more complex games which each generation develop and elaborate even further consequently in order, uh, in order to understand how sapiens behave we must describe the historical evolution of their actions referring only to our biological constant trend would be like a radio sportcaster who attending the world cup football championships offers his listener a detailed description of the playing field rather than an account of what the players are doing what games did our stone age ancestor play in the area arena of history as far as we know the people who who carved the st- straddle line man 
some 30,000 years ago had the same physical, emotional and intellectual abilities we have. What did they do when they woke up in the morning? What did they eat for breakfast and lunch? What were their societies like? Did they have relationship and nuclear families? Did they have ceremonies, moral codes, sport contests and religious rituals? Did they fight wars? The next chapter takes a peek behind the curtain of the ages examining what life was like in the millennia separating the cognitive revolution from the agriculture revolution.